Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to Good to see you guys and welcome to you guys that are watching online. We're glad that you're joining us this morning. Now we are in a series called Running with the Giants and this is installment three of that series. And we have a theme verse that we've been using and it's on your outline. I'm going to start out by reading that this morning. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Now, the first thing I want you to remember in this verse is that it starts with therefore, right? And it links it to the previous uh, statements or chapter that preceded it. And in that chapter, let me remind you that it's a whole list of folks, you know, and we call those our, um, they're significant, they're giants in the faith. We call it our Hall of Fame of faith people. And so it lists a whole bunch of people. And actually, we're pulling out the different names, and that's kind of what we're using in this series. And so uh, they, they provide not only a, a life well lived to give us an example uh, for encouragement, but they're actually there cheering you on, as this scripture says, that they make up this great cloud of witnesses. And so their job is to, to, uh, to cheer us on in our faith and to coach us, right? Now, as I was reading this, I began to think about uh, my life and what it means to me. And as growing up as a young person, a young adult, I was an athlete. And so I uh, was always in some sport or another, right? I think my uh, parents did that because I had ADHD, a lot of energy, right? Positive direction, she needs a sport every season. <laughs> so anyway, I was, uh, I was involved in a lot of them. And this, this particular scripture reminds me of when I was in track and field, okay? I love to run. And so uh, when I was reading this, uh, it reminded me of when I would go to do my meets, how my mom and my dad and uh, my brothers, sisters, friends of mine, they would all come out. They would sit in the stands, right? And then they would cheer me on. <laughs> They'd be yelling for me as I was running my race. And how many of you know you got ears to hear that kind of stuff? And so when you're running, I can't tell you emotionally what that did inside. And, and I believe when I read this scripture that God wants us to experience that same thing that in the arena of your life, there are these giants that are sitting there. There's Abraham and Sarah, right? There's Samuel, there's Jeremiah, there's Deborah, right? There's Rahab, and they're sitting up there, these giants, and they are rooting you on, right? They want you to be successful, and so you can hear them going, come on, you got this. Run, run, run with all your might. Put your heart into it. Push past the pain, and you can hear them cheering us on. At least I can hear them. And I was also having another thought when I read this, how there was this uh, special coach. I had a lot of different coaches, but there's one particular coach in my track and field where he would actually come down to the field and before I would go and get in the blocks to run, he would come over and he would talk to me and he would say to me, hey, Sharon, remember, remember what I taught you, right? And so he'd whisper these things and then he would help me to read my opponents and he would tell me how I, you know, I might need to make an adjustment. But most importantly, he would whisper in my ear, you got this. You're going to be first place. You got this. You can do it. You can finish that race and you can win. And that just breathes such confidence in me, Right. And I believe that that's what the giants of the faith want to do for us. They want to be our personal coach. They want to come right down into your life, and they want to breathe on you. They want to help you to run your race successfully. 
See, they've already run their race. They've already, uh, you know, got the prize. And now their job is to coach us and to help us to be able to understand what we need to do. The adjustments need, needing to be made so that our thinking and our actions would line up with one that would be successful in our faith. Now, I am so excited about this. This is a great message today. God is breathed on it. I'm expecting him to do great things to you, for you guys today, right? Because when I read this scripture, I see in there that says, because we have this cloud of witnesses, that you and I, our job then is to just to throw off all the things that hinder us and to understand and to identify the sin that can sideline us. And so in that, we can run with perseverance the race that God has placed in front of us, meaning that he has set us up for success. I love that. He has set us up for success, and all we need to do is push forward. Isn't that exciting this morning? I think that is just wonderful. Well, let me go ahead and pray, and I'm going to invite the Holy Spirit to come even more than he is in this room right now. Father God, I thank you. I thank you that this message, Lord, is something that you have crafted for your people, Lord, called according to your name, and that it is your desire, Father, to help them to be successful, each and every one of them, in the race that you have called them. God says that he has called you to an individual race, unlike other people's, and it is here that he wants to equip you. It is here that he wants to breathe into you the ability to run it, to run your race and to be successful, to, to achieve that crown that he has for you. So, Father... I ask that you would come, and with the heaviness of the day and the rain, I ask that you push away all distractions in the name of Jesus, and that your Holy Spirit, your power, would fill up this room, Lord, that you would awaken us, Father, that we might attend to what the Spirit of God is breathing in us and telling us today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Good. While we are looking at the giants of the faith, and today the one we're going to pull out and we're going to look at is Sarah okay, is Sarah. Now, she is the wife of Abraham. You see, God chose Sarah and Abraham uh, to be able to start a line that he wanted to work through, the Jewish people. So he's going to use them to establish this line. And we know it's through the, G that through the Jewish people that God has, uh, will give us our Savior, Jesus Christ. So these folks are very important, and they go together. They're coupled together, right? And so we hear often that Abraham is the patriarch of the faith. He's the father of the faith. And you know what, Sarah, she's the matriarch of the faith. She's the mother of the faith. And so again, these are folks that are very important. And I am excited to come and talk to you about Sarah because I think Sarah is so much like each and every one of us, you know? How so, Sharon? Well, I see Sarah where God has given her a word, right? And there's delay. And that's kind of like us. God gives us a word. He gives us um, just, you know, things we read in the Bible. Go, yeah, that's for me. And or God will quicken us when we're praying about something. And he'll say, here's a word for that situation, for that circumstance. And so we stand on it and we're waiting and we're waiting and nothing's happening, right? And so we can kind of get impatient and go, gosh, God, what's going on here, right? This is hard. For example, um, you know, you could, you could get a word if you're a parent, and the word is, you know, something like train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he won't depart from his ways, right? And so you grabbed hold of that word, and you said, I'm going to use that to work with my kids, to train them up, and then all of a sudden they grow up, and there are teens and young adults, and boy, do they start to challenge you, you know? All of a sudden, they start doing things and, and taking uh, d courses or going in a direction, making choices. And you go, wait a minute, I didn't teach you this. <laughs> What's going on here, right? And so you start to wonder, well, wait a minute, God. I was standing on your promise, right? I read your word. I believed it. I, I, What's going on? And so you start to pray, and you pray, and you pray, and you hope, and you hope, and you hope right? And you look and you go, long, God, how long before you answer my prayer? How long before that promise comes and manifests itself before us? And so we wrestle and we wonder, God, where are you? Did I do something wrong? Did I miss you? Where are you in this? And so we get, start to struggle and we almost feel like we can give up, throw in the towel, right? Now, I just did children, but I could do your spouse, you know, I could do your career, I could do your health, all of those things. You have promises. If you're a believer, you have promises that God has shown you. You've read his word and you stand on things, but they don't always uh, seem to be fulfilling. Matter of fact, some of them can seem like they're going in the opposite direction and you're wondering, 
what the heck, God, right? Well, here you go. Sarah is like us. She gets it, right? Because her life, and the reason she's stepping forward is because her life is like that. She had a promise given and a delay, and it was hard for her. And so she wants us to watch and see how she ran her race so that we can gra grab hold of some principles that will help us when we're faced with that same situation. So on your outline, let me acquaint you with the, uh, the promise that was given because everything is going to come out of this promise. And remember, they go together, uh, Abraham and Sarah, as a unit. So it, whenever I talk about Abraham, I'm almost talking about Sarah and her involvement here. So in Genesis 15, 1 through 5, on your outline, it says, The word of the Lord came to Abram. Now, I'm going to stop there for a minute before I finish reading that. And I want you to circle Abram. Now, the reason I stopped here is because Abram's name will be changed to Abraham right? Sarah's name will also be changed. It was Sarai, it goes to Sarah, right? Now, the reason I stopped to talk to you about that is because it's very significant. It's very significant. See, when God came to Abram and Sarai, they were, um, you know, they were not, they did not know God, okay? And so they were trying to follow after him, but they didn't know him. And so what's going to happen? God's going to come and he's going to work on them. And all of a sudden, they are going to be able to begin to look like God in God's image, right? And so what's happening in their name change is the A-H, the ha, huh, right? Part of it is God's image is going to be inserted into their name. So now it's Sarah, right, with the A-H, and Abraham has the A-H in it, signifying physically what is happening in the spiritual world. Isn't that cool? Every part of Scripture, guys, every part of Scripture speaks to us if we allow it to. So... Coming back here, let me continue on. I got, I got on a sidetrack there, but how do you know? It's exciting. It's exciting. Okay, it says, Genesis 15, 1 and 5, it says, The word of the Lord came to Abram, the Lord uh, in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate, Eleazar of Damascus, right? It, of Damascus. Now, so Eleazar is going to inherit his, uh, inherit his belongings. And so you can, in this statement, I want to make sure you recognize there's a hopelessness. I don't have children. Okay, that's being said there. But then the Lord corrects him. He says this. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him aside and said, Look, God, look, look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. So shall your offspring be. Now, I read you that whole promise because I want you to see a couple of things here. That, that God is coming to Abram, but he's actually coming to Abram and to Sarah to give them a promise, right? Because the mystery of marriage, they are one. And uh, Abram here is reflecting what him and Sarai at the point are feeling. They're feeling this hopelessness of not being able to have children and their legacy being cut off. And also what I want you to note is this promise that's coming to them. Uh, if God would just heal their, uh, their ability to conceive, right, then they could bear children. But I'm going to fast forward because this particular promise isn't going to get answered for 25 years, right? And then, the, then, the, then Sarah, especially, and Abraham, will be long past being able to bear children. Okay, so that's the setting here, right? And then I love how at the end, this is so cool, at the end how God gives Abram this visual uh, to remind him of the promise. He says, look at the stars, right? And so he gets him to look at something visual, and he reminds him, just like every time he looks at the stars, that his offspring will be as numerous as that. Now, I love the way God works like this. Even last night, uh, a gentleman came forward for prayer, and we started praying for him and his marriage. And I was working with some of the other prayer team, and one of the fellows, I believe, had a word for him. And it was such a cool word because the word was that, that he was to proceed forward like a staircase, one step at a time, and that it, it spiraled around, but it would get him where he wanted to go. Isn't that cool? And I thought, God, you are just so great. I love the way he gives us his visual to, to, you know, to remind us of the promise that he gives. 
So that's what he did for Abram. He gave that. And now here you go. They're having to wait 25 years. And some stuff's going to happen here in that waiting period that we're going to talk about. Sarah, Sarah's going to get impatient. Okay, she's going to get impatient here and she's she's not going to like the fact that she's getting older. She feels that she's going to be unable to have children. And so now she's like, my goodness, I got to do something. Right. So she's going to hatch her own plan and she's going to make a huge mess of it. Matter of fact, this is the whole underlying problem with Sarah. And she wants us to be assured of that. So on your outline, I want you to fill this in. Right. When you can't understand God and impatience threatens to overwhelm you, don't complicate God's promise with your solution. Don't complicate the promise with your solution. In other words, don't insert yourself into it. You see, uh, Sarah's story is, is all about the challenge of facing things in our life that with the delay and losing hope and wanting to take control. And God's saying, you know, don't do that. Sarah's saying, hey, be careful not to do that, especially in the waiting phase. So a matter of fact, I put it on your outline, two things here. We have to trust God when, uh, even when it takes a long time, even when it takes a long time, okay? Uh, a lot of times God will give us a promise and it does take a while for it to, to push into the, the natural, into, into what we see, right? And uh, that is the truth of the matter. There's a delay there and we don't like that delay. It's hard for us. And so uh, we tend to think that God is notoriously slow, <laughs> as we know slowness to be, right? And it's in that place you get impatient. So that's what we see happening here to Sarah. It says Genesis 16, 1 and 2. This is what happened. Now Sarai, look at the name. Now Sarai, at, um, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had an Egyptian maidservant named Hagar. So she said to a Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my maidservant. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarah said, right? Now, what I want you to, to see here is that first, Sarai blamed who? God for closing down her womb, not answering it. So she's going to go and solve that, that problem herself. She's going to seize control of the situation, right? Yeah? She's woman, let her roar. <laughs> She's going to get control of that thing. And so that's what we see happening here. And guys, friends, when we get impatient, right, and we get overwhelmed by our circumstances, man, we really can have some crazy thoughts, <laughs> some really crazy thoughts. And they don't usually line up theologically with what really God is saying about a situation, right? I mean, when you look at this story, what wife is going to say to her husband, yeah, go have sex with that woman? Uh, I don't think so, right? No, not at all, not at all. And then to say, and God said it's going to be okay, and that's how the promise is coming. I mean, you're just not going to hear that. That's crazy thinking, isn't it? That's sick thinking, actually. And here you go. The truth of the matter is stuff like this happens all the time. Maybe not specifically like this story, but it happens. For example, I talked to many women who had gotten themselves in pickles, right? In other words, they were waiting for their husband, especially the young ones. They're waiting. They believe God's going to bring that right person that, you know, that loves the Lord like they do. And so they're waiting and they're waiting and they're waiting. And pretty soon they start to get impatient. They start to get overwhelmed with life. So they're going to help God out. They're going to help him out because they're going to go and find somebody themselves. And they're going to choose that. Hey, I'm speaking to some women here. They're going to choose that from the pool of people that are around them thinking I'll get the best one that's available. But here's what happens. Here's what happens. They end up choosing somebody who usually isn't even a believer like they are. Okay? Or they end up in a compromising situation where they can't get that person to commit, so they end up having sex with them or living with them. And here you go. And then they start to justify why it's okay, even though the word says don't do that. It's okay because I'm helping to facilitate this promise that God said that I would have a husband. Right? Right? Now, I'm picking on the girls in here, but I could have done it with guys, right? We tend to do this. This is real stuff. That's why Sarah's stuff speaks to me. I see it all the time. And so we need to attend to the lessons that she wants to show us because this is the kind of stuff that will sideline us. And I didn't forget what Abraham said here, where he agreed. I mean, really? What happened to the stars, right? You're supposed to be looking at what happened here. Why did he agree to that? Why did Abraham agree to that? Because he was in a crisis himself. 
He was in a crisis of faith himself, and the person that he loves said that, and instead of standing up and saying, no, this is what the Lord says we should do, he shrinked back and he said, all right, right? And so what happens is he does sleep with Hagar. They do have a child, right, Ishmael. And so what happens is it creates such division in his home that Abraham is going to have to break his own heart again because he's going to have to send that son away or he's going to lose his wife, Sarah. Okay, huge, huge. When we take things into our own hands, we make such a mess of stuff. And we're tempted when there's a delay not to trust God that he's going to fulfill it. And Sarah is saying to us, don't do that. Another thing that Coach Sarah says to us in trusting God is that we need to trust him even if it seems ridiculous. Even if he seems ridiculous, not normal. Now, as a pastor, I kind of giggle at this because it seems like Christians want God to be normal, <laughs> right? Their Christianity to be normal. And uh, God is anything but normal, let me tell you. At least not normal as we understand it, all right? And so why? Why is God not our normal? Because our normal is, is judged according to our normal meter. What's a normal meter? A normal meter is something that you have inside that you gain through your, um, through your culture, right, through your families and stuff. And you say, this is what's normal, this is abnormal. And so you judge the world according to that, yet God's ways are not your ways, right? And so God knows what normal is supposed to be. And so our normal meter is actually broken, right? And so God isn't going to move in that way that you think he should. When I was thinking about this concept, I thought about when I started doing missions in the third world country, right? I went with my normal meter on things, how things are supposed to work, you know? And I had set up to do some conferences for some pastors in this country that I was in. And uh, so I set them up and I set the time, had all this stuff. And, and so they come in an hour behind time. I'm like, are you kidding me? Right? And so I thought, okay, this is an anomaly. So I go on to the next conference. I'll be dang on if that thing didn't happen again, that they came in, wasn't quite an hour. This minute, this time was 45 minutes late. Right? And then I did yet another one, and it happened again where they came in and they delayed. And so I was thinking, what's going on here? Right? So I talked to the uh, missionary that we were working with, and he looked at me and goes, hey, your normal is not their normal. And if you don't adjust, you're going to be frustrated. Right? And I thought, gosh, that's kind of like God. His normal is not our normal. And it's going to challenge us every time. It challenged, it challenged Sarah. I mean, she had to wait 25 years for this promise to be fulfilled. It's really tough, right, to wait that long. And so that didn't meet her normal meter. And so that's what we see. And now the angels are going to come. There's the two. They're, they're angels, right? They call them the Lord. And they're going to come and they're going to remind Abraham and Sarah of the promise and how it's going to be fulfilled here. Again, not in the normal meter. Uh, it says Genesis 18, 10 through 14 says this. The Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year. And Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance of the tent. Abraham and Sarah were really old. Sarah was past the age of bearing. She, right, she's 90 when this is going on and he's 100. So Sarah laughed to herself, and she thought, after I am worn out and my master is old, will I, have, will I now have this pleasure? In other words, outside her normal meter, right? Then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, will I really have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Now, I love that because God's coming, he's cycling back around to re -breathe, you know, breathe onto the promise that's given, right? And Sarah's having a hard time because it's not in her normal meter. So she's struggling and she says, you know, says that she laughed and it wasn't like a little, oh, isn't that cute? No, it was like, huh, are you kidding God? Right? And so her laughter was a mock. It was a challenge and that's why she gets called down for it right, for the lack of faith that she had there. And so then the, the uh, angel or the Lord, he speaks back into the situation and breathes back on that promise. And so Sarah wants us to be able to see that we need to be able to trust God even when it seems ridiculous and outside of our normal meter. And we need to trust him even if there's a long period. And so Coach Sarah is really wanting us to, to be able to, to take the, 
the uh, reins of our life and be able to know what's coming on around us so that we can make those proper adjustments. And here you go. What we see here uh, with Sarah is that indeed she does trust the Lord. How do I know that? Because she decides to go uh, into Abraham's tent and have sex with him. She's 90, he's 100. This is a miracle, right? It's a miracle that they can have sex at that age. I'm like, whoa. And then lo and behold, what happens? She gets pregnant, right? It's cool. Right. So now she's, now she's seeing the fulfillment of that, and now she has some encouraging words she wants to share with us. And we can see here in Hebrews 11:11, 11, 11, it says this. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she conceived uh, him. She considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so, again, she, it's, she's in the hall of fame. Why? Because she acted in faith that God could indeed do something that was totally impossible, right? And so she walked that way. And even though, and I love the fact that, man, she messed up for a long, long time, yet God didn't forget his promise. He didn't count her out. He still made sure that that promise came about, and he worked with her even at age 90, guys. So that gives me encouragement that when I mess up, when we mess up, it didn't change God's plans for us. It really doesn't. We might have to reroute things, might cause us a lot of pain in our life, but he is so very faithful, very faithful. Now I see, I see Sarah and the minutes remaining with me, that she's going to come down like that coach did when I was getting ready to get on the track and, you know, get in the blocks, and he would come and he'd whisper a couple things to me, right? Well, I see Sarah, she's coming down, and she wants to breathe some words of encouragement to you and I. And this first one she wants to whisper is, don't try to get ahead of God when he isn't moving fast enough for you. <laughs> don't get ahead of God when he isn't moving fast enough for you. And I don't know, if this one really speaks to me, really speaks to me. This is very important. You know, when, again, when I was getting ready to, to run, uh, one of the things that my coach would say is run your race, right? Keep the pace. And so he would, he would tell me how I needed to do this. And for me, being a type A personality, I like to get things done yesterday, right? You know, at work, I might ask for something. How many of you know type A people want it done yesterday? I mean, they just want it done before they even say it, right? They're just go, go, go. Well, that's, that's my personality. And so being a mover and a shaker, here's what happens. I run out in front of the Lord a lot of times. I get burned out. I burn other people out. <laughs> you know, problems I go to solve, I create more problems, right? Yeah, I know that about myself. You need to know yourself. You need to know yourself also. And for me, because I know myself, I have to remind myself that God is not slow in his promise. It will come about. He's being patient and he's developing things around me so that the promise can manifest itself. So I have to start talking to myself, right, and helping. And you might be going, oh, well, that sounds fine, Sharon. I know that. But what the heck do you do with all those emotions that are raging inside in your brain that wants to go on overload, right? You know, do I sit down? Do I stay still? Do I go forward, right? And then the emotions that are yelling at you to solve the problem, stop the pain. Where is God, right? How do we deal with those, those emotions and that, that thinking process during this waiting that we know that God's doing something, but how do we get ourselves to settle down, correct? How do we do that? Well, I believe the scriptures tell us in Psalm 37, 7, it says this, be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for him to act. Don't worry about evil people who prosper or fret about their wicked schemes. And the reason I put this down is because the secret of waiting, this is worth the whole time you're here today. The secret of waiting is found in that first first phrase there. And I want you to circle it. I want you to underline it. I want you to start. I want you to do everything you can to draw attention to it. It says, be still in the presence of the Lord. To be still in the presence of the Lord. So if we're still, then we're able to do what else? To be patient and not to worry. Do you see that? So, but how do we get to be still, Sharon? What is that exactly does that look like? Well, I'm going to give you an application here. Okay, I'm going to give you an application. Here's what I'm going to suggest, right? And this is going to work. This is a game changer. It's been a big game changer for me. It will be for you. Listen, you spend 10 minutes every day, all week long, 10 minutes, right? 
I like to do it in the morning, but you can spend 10 minutes, it works in the daytime, where you just stop everything, everything, and you go and you sit in this quiet place. So that means that you don't have your 10 minutes with the TV on, or driving, or, or eating, or doing anything else, but that you just sit for 10 minutes. And in that 10 minutes, I want you to talk to God. If you can't talk to God, or you have a hard time, or you run out of things to say, or it's not positive, whatever, then, then uh, I suggest you turn your worship music on. Start singing. Start worshiping Jesus, right? And if, and if that doesn't, doesn't work, start reading his word, right? Those are tools to help you to, to stay focused in those 10 minutes. What are you doing? You are, what you're doing is you are establishing your beachhead, you're coming before the Lord and you're allowing him to come into you. And the very first thing that the Lord does when we step into him is he steps into us and he brings the Holy Spirit in us. And the thing that floods our life when the Holy Spirit comes in is the peace of Christ. And it goes way beyond anything that you're going to face that day or anything that you're facing in present day. Right? And he comes in and he talks to us. Now, for me, I know this works because I do this. I've been doing this most of my adult life. And I can tell you when I'm in that, that mode and I'm disciplined to do this, because you've got to fight like crazy to get it in your schedule, right? When I do this, when I give God that time, right, my whole day changes. The whole temple of it, how I see things begins to change because I set that time aside for the Lord. And a side note, those of you that latched on to the fact that I am... Uh, uh, ADHD, right? That means my brain's going in a hundred directions. I love to journal when I'm talking to the Lord. I write out my prayers. It slows everything down so I can talk to him. I read the scriptures. I write the scriptures and what it means to me. And in that place, I dialogue with him, right? In that place, I, I worship him. Those are all to help me. And what actually happens is the inside of us begins to, to, to calm itself. And you find your footing. You find your centering in the Lord. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you, this is a game changer in your life. It's a game changer. And, and I want to encourage you to run at this, to go after this. The power of the 10 is what I'm calling it. The 10 minutes a day, every day, right? 10 minutes, spend it with the Lord and see what would happen. See if that doesn't help you to be able to adjust and not get in front of God, but follow him wherever he leads you. Now, the next thing that Sarah wants to come and, and whisper into our ears is about focus, about our focus. She says, focus on what is happening in you, in you, and not what is happening to you. So she's encouraging us to look and to see what's happening inside of us, that that's a focus that she wants to bring to our attention. And again, to use my analogy, when I would uh, get ready for a competition, hey, everything was about how my thinking was, Right? My thinking in a game, my focus in a game may, was a game changer. So whether I won or lost, a lot had to do with my thinking and my emotional state. And so what was that that I was focusing on was the goal, was the prize of why I was doing this, right? And so in that getting that right focus, what happens is in running, I could, I could handle the demands that was going on my body right? The pain that I might be feeling or the difficulty or pushing through something really hard. Well, when you and I attend to our focus, when we have the right focus, we can face anything. We can do anything when we have that right focus uh, in our minds. We can handle the difficulties that come in our lives. We can handle, you know, the delays and the pain of life. And there's a lot of that. And so our focus is so key. You see, so many times people get sidelined because their focus uh, gets on to the problem or the pain in life or the delay. And so they miss things. And so the Holy Spirit wants to speak to us and say, no. Instead, look at what our focus should be. James 1, 2 and 4, it says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Now, I don't know about you, but when trials and pains come into my life, I don't go, yippee, I'm going to advance joy, <laughs> joyfully here. That's just not something that's inside of me, right? I want to scream, no! <laughs> I, I don't like that. But yet, over the years, if I have matured, I realize that when those pains and stuff come into our lives, when difficulties and delays, it's that place that we need to go to and say, God, what do you want to show me here? Because I know your promise is true. 
I know it's about to come. What are you wanting to develop in me? And so the whole perspective of pain, of difficulty, is to understand that God wants to do something and you enter in that dialogue with him. What is it that you want me to see here? You see, I started out and I stopped and told you about the name changes from Abraham, right? He was Abram, he's now Abraham. Sarah, is now, it was Sarai and it got changed, right? The aha, God's image. God is more concerned with your image, you know, who you are on the inside. He wants to know who you are more than your comfort in life. And as he told me last night, he wants to change many of your names. He said, pray for my aha to come in, that I would be able to push in, Sharon, and, and work with them so that their name would change to one who reflects me, children of the God most high. And so that's what God is after here, guys. That's what he's after. So for some of you, the next step on this uh, talk or this conversation I'm having today with you is some of you don't know Jesus Christ. In a moment, I'm going to pray, you know, for the service. I'm going to especially go after those of you that don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior because that's your next step. That's where you need to go. You see, it's all grew to, uh, everything I talked about is rooted and grounded in Jesus Christ. And so I'll give you that opportunity to confess him as your Lord and your Savior, right? The word says that if we believe in our hearts that he died for us on the cross for our sins and we confess it with our mouth, that's where salvation, that's where that exchange happens. And so, guys, that's why you're listening today. That's why God has you in this service today, right? So your next step, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, with the Heavenly Father, that's where you go next. And for those of you that do, your next step is to call the audible in your life and to slow down, to sit down and think about your faith journey and to ask yourself if there is difficulties there, if there is, um, you know, places where you're not sure what's the next direction, right? Then I'm going to suggest that you go for that power of the ten, that you incorporate that into your life, that you sit down for 10 minutes and you go before the Lord, not to beseech him to answer something, but just to experience him, that you would do that. And if you're, you're somebody like me and, and you do do that, well, then I'm going to challenge you to do it on a more regular basis, right? Because even I can challenge myself. I, you know, things get hectic and I can let that slip so easily. So let's put it right back in the forefront, right? And if you, if you spend 10 minutes, spend 20, right? Why? Because that is the source of every strength. That is the source of finishing the ways well, is being able to spend time with him. Now, here's the last promise that God wanted me to remind you, and I think Sarah's breathing on us now really heavily. It's in Isaiah 64, 4. It says, since before time began, no one has ever imagined, no ear heard, no eye has seen, a God like you who works for those who wait for him. It's in the waiting that we find that we are able to draw close to him. Bow your heads with me. I'm going to close in prayer. Father, I thank you for your, your presence here today. I thank you, Father, that the Holy Spirit has been moving, Lord, uh, freely. Hmm. Yes, indeed. Father says that the name change comes in the acknowledgement, like Sarah, when she stepped out into, into what God has said about her. When you act, when you sit, when you read, when you come close, you draw close to him, he draws close to you. Yes. All right. So those of you that don't have this relationship with Jesus Christ, I'm going to go there first. And so all of you that know Christ, I want you to be praying for those that don't know Christ right now. Okay? All right? So it's an act of the will to accept Jesus Christ. And I can feel the forces pushing against that. And so we just take authority over there in the name of Jesus. And those of you that want to come home, God wants you home. He loves you. You are, you are his precious one. And and so he's making sure this whole service slows down and stops so that you have that opportunity today to declare him as Lord and Savior. And so right where you're at, you don't have to get up, you don't have to do anything special. Right where you're at, you just say, Father God, go ahead and say it. Say, Father God, I want to draw close to you. 
So I accept your son, Jesus Christ, as my savior, the forgiver of my sins, and Jesus, the best way I know how, I ask you to be my leader, to take my life and to lead me. That's all. Holy Spirit, I ask that you'd seal that in their heart and I thank you that you wrote their name in the book of life, Lord. And just continue to grow them, Lord, nurture that. And Father, for the promise that you have given us that if we would wait, that in that process that you would change our name, I ask that you would reveal that to those that uh, believe in you, Lord Jesus, that as they spend that 10 minutes a day, as they are, yeah, as they take that challenge, Father, don't just meet it, surpass it. Blow them out of the water, Lord. Let them experience you like they never have. Meet them as you met me, Father. Meet their expectations and surpass that, Father. And I thank you, Lord, that in this waiting process, that we are devoted to you, Lord, and that we will uh, just learn to love you with all our heart, all our mind, all our soul, and with every breath of life that you have given us. For you are so worthy. Okay, I hear that. Father says, why? Why run this race to win? Now, this is Father. He says, because I have a crown of, of, of glory that I want to put on your head. He says, I have a crown for you. And I want to use those words, well done, good and faithful one, and he wants to give them to you. And he doesn't want anything to diminish that. So, Father, thank you. Thank you for reminding us Reminding us, Father, what awaits us. A well done and a crown and coming closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for tuning in to today's message. If God is impacting your life through this ministry, join us in reaching others by investing today. You can give by texting your donation amount to 757-230-2110 or by going to vineyardchurch.com slash give. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an update. We'll see you next week.